Well, first of all, I want to thank Meg Ryan and everybody with the Utah League of Cities and Towns for having me out here. Um, it's been a while since I've been out to Utah, though I make it out west a lot more often than I used to. Uh, today, during our discussion, we're going to, I'm going to take you to some places that you didn't think you were going to go, so, um, you know, be prepared for that, but I assure you that, that um, it'll, it will tie it all up at the end and it'll, it'll all make sense to you. Um, I think at this point we're all aware that there's a lot of disruption taking place in commercial sector, the retail sector specifically, um, but it's not enough just to be aware that there are these disruptions. Um, I think it's really important, as certainly as a planner, to understand why these disruptions are taking place. And so that's what we're going to go through, and then that's really the first half. And then um, the second half is uh, when we'll we'll put some, uh, put some remedies and prescriptions to the, uh, to the disruptions that we see taking place. But first, let's take a little bit of time to talk about my favorite subject. So um, I've been a planner now for uh, roughly 10 years, and prior to that, I was a software developer. So I, normally when I speak to groups, I say, I am reasonably sure I'm the biggest nerd in this room, and I think maybe I am. Um, a few years ago, well, three years ago specifically, um, I got involved with a, a group of planners in Ohio, just two other, two other gentlemen, and we were really interested in studying uh, the impact of autonomous vehicles on, on cities because nobody seemed to be talking about this and it seemed like it was going to, be, going to happen. And so for the, that very first year, we started doing presentations in the Midwest and, and educating people and we spent a lot of our time just assuring people that, hey, this is gonna happen, here's, here's how the technology works. And then really within about a year and a half, that conversation had shifted dramatically. It wasn't just educating people about the technology. It, now it was like, okay, we believe it, it's gonna happen, so, so what does that mean? Well, we got invited to, um, to a policy session. So I belong to the American Planning Association and they had a policy work session in DC where we were, um, we were put in a room with about 60 to 70 other professionals across the United States, and we were there just to talk about the policy implications of autonomous vehicles. And it was at that meeting that we met some folks from the University of Oregon, and they were starting up a, a network, an organization, a think tank called Urbanism Next, and their, uh, their goal was to research the secondary impacts of autonomous vehicles, which I found very interesting. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't really all that enamored with, you know, the, the, the vehicles and, you know, the impact on, you know, roads or whatever. I was really interested in the secondary impacts, but it was through that education on the secondary impacts that I did start to see the big picture, and I'm like, wow, this is, you know, this is some serious stuff. So um, I want to take a brief moment here to show you a real short video that explains what Urbanism Next is, because I think this would be uh, of great interest to a lot of you in the audience, and, and, um, and I would encourage you to reach out to them, because they really have put together a, a really strong network of individuals um, across the United States that really know their stuff. So uh, here, we'll t it's, it's, like, it's about a three minute video. With Urbanism Next here at the University of Oregon, what we're looking at is upcoming changes that we're seeing in technologies such as autonomous vehicles, e-commerce, and the sharing economy. How are these changes going to be affecting city form, city design, city development? And what are the secondary effects of these technologies? How will it have effects on, for instance, land use or land valuation? How will it affect things like equity? What are these changes that are going to be coming and how do we prepare for them?
right now we're doing research on the basic framework of how we might approach these questions and gathering data and research from around the country that looks at some of these questions. And the truth is that there's not a whole lot of research on these topics out there right now. We're organizing a framework for this research and we're developing a network around the country of people who are working on these topics. Our hope is that this group, this uh, network that we've developed, can actually help cities figure out how to accommodate the changes that are coming. Some of the other research we're doing, we're looking at things like municipal budgets and how it is that these uh, changes to technologies are going to be affecting municipal budgets across the spectrum, all the revenue side and the expenditure side of cities. And some of, these, some of the things we're finding are not all that positive. We really do need to be prepared. The scariest outcome is if we start to have parallel and very unequal systems of mobility available, and I think there are tremendous implications for equity there. We are on the precipice of huge changes with this technology. It is coming whether we like it or not. I'd say definitely one of the challenges or threats is, is not having enough conversations about regulations and not being forward enough to think with an equity lens in mind. Autonomous vehicles are happening. They're coming. It's not science fiction. It's science fact. So it's going to be maybe a bifurcation where some will really be accelerated forward in the growth and the vitality and the, the health and the lifestyle of a city by this change and others will really be left uh, kind of wondering what did they just miss and the train will be far down the tracks. The time to act is now. While there's a tremendous uh, opportunity for threats from these technologies, there's also a lot of opportunities for optimism. I think that technology is amazing, and I love the idea that uh, we have innovation that's impacting the way we travel. We're in the process of experiencing a kind of a change in how we live in the city, how we use the city, how we perceive the city. Focusing now on regulations and incentives that would encourage autonomous technologies for transit and encourage um, shared rides could hopefully help alleviate some of those negative outcomes. I hope that, that we can sort of embrace the idea of using this technology as a tool to address so many of our sort of urban and, and environmental and social issues. I mean, these are big macro global changes we're talking about, and so uh, our ability to deal with them is, is, it'll be a good test for humanity. So last, oh, this past March, uh, Urbanism Next held their first uh, annual conference and we put together a, a small team of three, well there were actually four of us, and we did a presentation called The Amazoning of America, which is what the title of today's presentation is, except this was, you know, that was version one. We are now on version like 20. I mean, that's how quickly things have changed. But in the process of researching what we were going to talk about, uh, I kind of stumbled upon an area that I thought was going largely unnoticed and, and I determined that this was going to be rather impactful and I was really interested in retail and commercial and that, you know, the secondary impacts of things like robotics and autonomous vehicles on that sector because I, I saw great change coming. So we did this presentation and afterwards um, City Lab, you know, um, part of the Atlantic, they, they interviewed us and they thought, they thought it was really interesting. And once they did that and they published that article, things started to blow up. And we started to do more and more research and became more and more involved with Urbanism Next. And um, since then, we've, we've met, you know, I've gone out to Portland several times. And we've started looking into the things like, you know, what is the impact or what is the change in land value if uh, autonomous vehicles are, you know, we realize them like we think we are going to uh, realize them. And, you know, the answers to these questions, you know, you know, we have not, well, we haven't answered them yet. We've created a bunch of models and we've asked a lot of questions, but we're still in the process of, of conducting this research. And to the best of our knowledge, there really isn't anybody else in the country that's diving in to the secondary impacts like this particular group is. So I was hanging out um, with my buddy, Jeff, Anybody know Jeff Bezos? So I was hanging out with Jeff, and Jeff goes, Rick, Rick, what exactly is Amazoning? 
And I said, well, Jeff, that's a very good question. So it's, it's obviously a play on words, Amazon and zoning. Um, but Amazon is really just my muse. Uh, Amazon, is, Amazon represents you know, the, the significant change that is happening in retail. Um, it, it, it isn't really just about Amazon. Um, it, it, it's really about a lot more things. And then zoning is, is meant to represent the, you know, the impact on, on cities. And so I, I've determined that I think Amazonia really is the, the convergence of, of three phenomena. Um, an overbuilt retail environment, uh, the growth strategies of publicly traded companies, and technology in general. And so we're going to talk about each of these, uh, and we'll start with uh, we'll start with growth strategies. And basically, uh, if you're not familiar with the way publicly traded companies work, it's it's pretty simple. Um, you're expected to grow um, because you have to make profits and you have to return value to shareholders. So it's a grow or die um, approach to business. And so there's there's really three primary ways that companies can grow. Um, it's through um, expansion, uh, partnerships, and mergers and acquisitions. And we're going to talk about how those three approaches uh, uh, impact uh, the overall growth strategies. So Amazon's only been around since 1994, but since then, you know, we, we've experienced a significant amount of change. Um, we've lost about 50% of our, our physical bookstores since, since Amazon came on the scene. But, you know, a Amazon has had um, mixed results with creating new businesses out of whole cloth. I think maybe the most uh, obvious exception is what's called um, Amazon Web Services or AWS. But short of that, uh, it's primarily been a series of mergers and acquisitions. So we, we organized them here in, you know, uh, chronologically. And you can see, like in recent years, they've really ramped up their, their, um, their approach to, to mergers and acquisitions. And, you know, many of these companies were acquired for the technologies uh, that, 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 that were originally developed, um, and the tech was either discarded or integrated, and the companies that originated it uh, either ceased to exist or look, look radically different today. But in my opinion, the most interesting of all those acquisitions was, was Whole Foods, and so that, that took place last year. Um, it, that acquisition did a number of things. First, it bought them instant credibility in the grocery world. You know, they had had mixed results with trying to penetrate the grocery market. Um, it also made them a player in the food as a delivery service. Um, but maybe the most interesting piece about it is it bought them something that historically they had, they had avoided, and that was real estate. So now they've got uh, a physical presence in the market, and as a matter of fact, uh, we in Columbus we have three or four different Amazon distribution centers at this point, and there might even be a fifth one coming online. They don't actually own those things; they lease them. Now they work closely with the developer, so it's developed to their specs. But they don't; they do do not own that real estate. So this was really the most significant um, step into uh, owning real estate. So more than, more than half of American households with incomes over 100,000 are Amazon Prime subscribers. And those same families typically spend about $500 a month on Whole Foods. So you can see that they, this, is, this is their attempt to, to kind of merge those two worlds, merge the, merge the online world with the, with the physical retail world. So here's a map of the Whole Foods locations. Um, there's about 183 million people, or 56% of the population, that's within a 30-minute drive of a Whole Foods. And uh, last year, four out of every $10 spent online was with, a, was with Amazon. Um, some, am some analysts believe that 
This acquisition of Whole Foods uh, represents Amazon's um, last uh, uh, origin mode of goods uh, in the last mile. So when we talk about the last mile, we're talking about the distance between a good arriving to you at your home and where it is originating from. Um, so analy some analysts think that this might be um, one of those nodes in the last mile. Um, and I'm, I'm not so sure. So uh, Kohl's began a partnership with Amazon last year, which I, I think is pretty interesting. Um, Kohl's has about a little under 1,200 stores in the U.S. Um, these are generally not located inside malls. They're usually in smaller, smaller strip centers. And it's actually um, that, that strategy has actually protected them somewhat from a lot of the uh, a lot of the, the, the negatives associated with the, the quote unquote retail apocalypse. Um, so this, this partnership allows Amazon customers to walk into a Kohl's store and bring their returns there. And they're taking another step further. So Kohl's is going to start uh, selling goods that you can buy on Amazon. So I think it's a pretty smart strategy on, on Kohl's part because Kohl's has shown a willingness to, to experiment with different things to, to, you know, to maintain viability in the marketplace. In addition to the, the partnership with Amazon, uh, Kohl's is also partnering with Aldi's, you know, the, small, the small discount grocer. Um, the average Kohl's store right now is about, well, it falls in a range, uh, generally like 80, up to 85,000 square feet to 30,000 square feet, and that's a lot of square feet. So what Kohl's is doing is they're contracting their stores. They're making them smaller. They're doing more stuff online. And then in the parts of the stores that have been vacated, that's the stuff that they're going to be allocating to Aldi's. That's the part of the store that they're going to be allocating to, to Amazon. So I think, it's a, I think it's a really smart approach. You know, it's an example of e-commerce and brick and mortar uh, you know, merging together. And, they're, and, and in the retail industry, they have a name for that, and that, that's called omnichannel. Omni-channel sales. So here's where the Kohl's locations are. So there's 267 million people, or 81% of the population, within a 30-minute drive of a Kohl's. So if Amazon is partnering with Kohl's and they've already acquired Whole Foods, you know, does 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 Kohl's in conjunction um, with the Whole Foods, does that represent that node in the last mile? And I, and I don't think it is. I don't think they're done. And I want to bring this up. So earlier this year, Amazon uh, announced that they were purchasing the Ring Video Doorbell Company. I, you've probably seen the commercials on TV. Um, you know, why do you think Amazon acquired the Ring Video Doorbell Company? Just because it's a, it's a neat company? Anybody have any ideas? Well, you're yes, that that is part of it, but it, I think it's I think it even goes a step further. Amazon wants to get inside your home. You know, they don't just want to monitor the packages that come to your home. They want to get inside of your home. So that's a little it's a little scary, a little creepy. However, one of one of the things I do for fun because remember what I told you at the beginning is, you know, I am a huge nerd. I like to look at patents. You know, who has filed patents for, for what sort of devices? And Amazon, it's kind of fun. Uh, Amazon and some others kind of go, you know, tit for tat in, in, the, in the patent wars. But Amazon has a, a patent along with a, a partner for a robot that detaches from a vehicle the robot has pa your packages inside of it. It goes inside your home, and using GPS and, and, and a map that it's already loaded in it, it can unload groceries into your pantry. I mean, that's what the patent's for. So this robot that rolls out, goes inside, put, puts the groceries away. So, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah, that's a it's a little, it's a little unsettling, so we'll let that sink in. <laughs> so earlier this year, Amazon also acquired another company. Uh, they acquired the, the PillPack 
company. So PillPack is another uh, online company that they, they dispense your prescriptions into little packets and they're organized by, by day and by time of day. So it's, it's just a, a more convenient version of you know, those, those pill organizer things. And so um, I used to, you know, I used to like look at my grandmother and I'm like, wow, you need, you need, or now my parents, like, wow, you need, the, you know, this, this pill organizer thing, you know, well, you can't keep track of that stuff. So about a month ago, I got a case of poison ivy that was so bad it sent me to the ER um, twice. And it looked like I had second degree burns up and down my legs. And they prescribed seven different medications that all had to be taken at different times of the day and in various amounts. And lo and behold, what did I end up doing? <laughs> I, found, I found myself using that same sort of organizer that I was making fun of my parents for. So, you know, that'll teach me. Um, you're probably familiar with uh, Amazon's search for uh, a second headquarters, what they call HQ2. Um, I have some theories as to what might be motiv motivating them to, to, uh, to build the second headquarters. And one of the things, um, one of the things I think they, they've got in the back of their mind is they, they not only want to get into healthcare, um, I think they want to get into insurance. They want to get into anything that anybody will allow them to get into. And they are likely anticipating that at some point the government's going to say, no, let's put the brakes on here. We're going to break you up. You're, you're too big. And we're going to split you into separate companies. And so I think, I think that's what HQ2 is really all about. But I guess the only time will tell. Did anybody here know Am Amazon had physical bookstores? Yeah, so there aren't, there aren't a whole lot of them. Um, but it, it is an indication that this so-called retail apocalypse might not be exactly what we think it is. Um, you know, a lot, the, the common wisdom is the retail apocalypse is, is uh, precipitated by the rise of e-commerce. But you know, Amazon's recent moves, you know, acquiring Whole Foods, the partnership with Kohl's, um, and, and then having their own physical bookstores. Um, it, it, to me, it's a clear indication that, the re, you know, this retail apocalypse might really be more about um, the importance of this omni-channel method of, of selling, you know, having different ways to, to, to sell the goods to the consumer, either through a physical store or, or through online. And we've got some very recent examples that that's likely true. Um, you know, PetSmart has acquired Chewy, the, the on online uh, you know, pet supply, food delivery service. Uh, IKEA acquired TaskRabbit. So TaskRabbit is this, uh, you, know, it's a, it's a, you know, it's an internet-based firm where you can hire people to basically do things for you, you know, like your own, your own personal assistant. And Albertsons, the grocery store chain, acquired the, uh, the meal delivery kit service plated. So it, I really do think this is more, more about omni-channel than strictly uh, the rise of e-commerce. Um, you know, there, there, there's an elephant in the room, I think. Uh, you know, we've been doing all this talking about uh, Amazon and, and omni-channel retail, but you know, about 30 years ago, there were a lot of rumblings, probably with groups of people just like yourself, and they were really worried about this, this large retailer that was coming in and killing off Main Street retail. And, you know, everybody was freaking out about it. And so that company is, yeah, this is Walmart. And so Walmart's strategy instead of just simply moving into the most densely populated areas, was to go into some of those smaller towns. And they found a great deal of success, success there. Um, last year, 95% of Americans shopped at Walmart. Last year. Uh, Walmart's the largest employer in 22 states. They've got uh, almost 800 million square feet of real estate. Which, making them one of the largest real estate holders in the United States. Uh, and, and they employ 1.4 million people. Uh, so, you know, I, I mentioned that, that patent pending for, 
for, uh, for Amazon about that robot that puts stuff away. Well, Amazon has very similar patents, and, I, and they've even taken it a step further. Amazon has a patent for basically a, uh, it, it replaces your pantry. It's an, it's an Amazon pantry. And so it's, it's monitoring goods and the weight of goods. It's got cameras and sensors in it. So as you take stuff out, you know, you, eat, you, you know, take potato chips out of the bag and put it back, it knows how many potato chips you took out of the bag and then it'll, it'll basically load your cart up for you and then prepare to deliver, deliver those potato chips when you run out of potato chips. So, um, and, and they also have patents for very similar delivery vehicles with the same robotic technology. And it's not just these two. Um, there, are, there are patents all over, and there's a lot of activity in China with, uh, with some tech, tech companies um, to build these things, to get inside your home. So um, is it, could it be convenient? Yeah, could it be convenient? Is it scary? I find it extremely <laughs> scary. You know, I, so, you know, I am not carrying the water for tech. I want to make that very clear. I mean, I love tech. I, you know, I've got a background in tech. But, you know, I believe we need to tread cautiously. And we need to, we need to start asking some hard questions and push back when it is appropriate. But here's the list of, or a map of the Walmart locations in the U.S., 295 million people are within a 20-minute drive of a Walmart. I would ask for a show of hands of who lives within a 20-minute drive, but I'm pretty sure almost all of you would put your hands up. Um, you know, but even with this sort of, this sort of coverage, uh, Walmart understood that they were playing catch-up in the e-commerce arena. And so two years ago, they acquired the online retailer Jet.com. And that immediately provided Walmart that, that uh, technical infrastructure that they needed to compete with Amazon. You know, and prior to that acquisition, Amazon sales were, sim were just a fraction of, of, uh, of Walmart sales. Um, you know, the, the, you know, the, the Jet.com acquisition, uh, these patents, you know, this is example, you know, more examples of the importance of this mergers and acquisitions strategy. Um, and, and as strong as Amazon is, uh, you know, last year, 90% uh, of retail purchases st still took place in, in brick and mortar. So let's talk a little bit about technology. Um, we're living in a period of unprecedented change. Uh, when I graduated from high school in 1989, I got a, the graduation gift of a typewriter in 1989. My parents graduated high school in 1959. Do you know what they got for a graduation gift? They got a typewriter. My daughter's 15. She types entire papers on a phone that fits in your hand. To give you an idea of the amount of change that we're living in, you know, the unprecedented amount of change, it's it's stunning, you know, when you look at it that way. Uh, you know, technology is a, is a rather vague term, but in the context of this discussion, I, I think there's some really key technologies that we need to pay attention to. It's artificial intelligence, e-commerce, mobile computing and cloud computing, virtual and augmented reality, uh, blockchain technology, autonomy, and robotics. So let's dive into these a, a little bit. Artificial intelligence, you know, so before we use the term artificial intelligence, we, we used to talk about things like predictive analytics. So if you've ever used a, uh, a frequent shopper's card um, and then coupons spit out after you use your shopping card or, or you get things mailed to you or it's, it's recommending different items, that is an example of predictive analytics. And artificial intelligence is really predictive analytics on steroids. It is much more powerful. So AI, AI can exist over here and it can exist over here. This company's got their own AI, this other company's got their own AI. But these AIs, if they ever meet one another, they can actually talk to one another and teach each other things and learn things 
just like humans learn things. So effectively, that's what art, artificial intelligence is. It's mimicking the cognitive functions of, of actual human beings. And the cost of AI has come down so much that even somebody like me can afford to dabble with some of these open source AI tools. Um, AI in the, in the retail sector, um, it, it, not by itself, it, it's, it's not entirely powerful, but when you combine it with some of these other technologies, it becomes an extremely powerful tool. Um, let's, let's talk about e-commerce, mobile, and cloud computing. And then keep in mind, you know, we, you know AI is, is lingering in the background of all this. So cloud computing is really an old concept. Uh, my first job out of college was a, as a mainframe computer programmer. So a mainframe computer is just a really huge computer uh, that fits in a, sits in a big room, and then I, the programmer, sit at what's called a dumb terminal, and then I access the main pro, mainframe, program, uh, mainframe computer. So all the processing, all the storage, all the heavy lifting takes place on the mainframe. Well, cloud computing is really the same thing, except instead of a mainframe, We've got all these little different servers that are linked together, and they offload the processing cap uh, capabilities across all the different servers. And instead of just using dump terminals, now we're using things like our phones and, uh, and laptops. Um, so, it, but it's cloud computing that really provides the backbone for e-commerce. It's that ability to, to distribute that, that processing across these multiple computers is what, you know, that cloud infrastructure is what facilitates this mobile computing environment. And as of last year, about 50% of all e-commerce took place on a mobile device. Uh, one third of all e-commerce actually took place on your, on your phone. I personally find it somewhat cumbersome sometimes to deal with, you know, mass purchases on my phone, and so I'll defer to my tablet or, or I'll sit down, actually sit down on a, on a computer. Um, but ironically, it's these same mobile devices that may end up um, not saving, but uh, helping brick and mortar retail, and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit shortly here. So this is, you know, I try to minimize the amount of words and graphs and whatnot, but this is a this is a graph showing the, um, the quarterly share of e-commerce sales in the U.S. Uh, from 2010 to the second quarter of 2018. And so it's going from roughly 4% to 10%. Um, so 10% doesn't sound like much. Uh, it's been, you know, the share of e-commerce sales of all retail has been growing at a, at a clip of about 15% a year. I think that number is getting ready to explode. Um, you know, when I look at this, uh, I, I think within five years, we're probably going to double that and go to 20%. And then within about 10 to 15 years, uh, I, I think we're looking at about 50% of all, all retail transactions will, will be made online. But keep in mind, that's also, um, that's also taken into account that uh, e-commerce is changing. And we've got this omni-channel approach to retail. So while it's taking place online, that still generally means that there, there's likely to be a physical store behind, behind all of that. So this is probably impossible for you to read, but this is the share of different types of goods and what we're willing to purchase online versus what, we're, what we would rather go to a store for. So to no surprise, you know, your big ticket items, your major appliances, your automobiles, you know, we want, we generally want to be at the, the point of sale when we purchase those things. And some of the, the lower, lower order goods or the, the goods with the, um, that are relatively um, inelastic, like, uh, you know, books, groceries, and, you know, and toys, uh, we're more willing to, to purchase those online. If we check back on this in, in five years, I think this is going to significantly change. So I did, in the course of my own research, I looked at, uh, you know, the average goods that a household purchases throughout a year, and my math came up with about 65% of those goods I really don't need to go to the store for. Those are those are very common repeat repeat purchases for me. So I don't, 
You know, I don't need to, to stare at a box of, uh, of Cheerios. I know my kids are going to eat about five boxes of Cheerios, and I'm not kidding. It's about five boxes of Cheerios a week. It's ridiculous. <laughs> so virtual and augmented reality. So it's, um, it's a pretty interesting tech, you know, group of technologies, but they are, they are, they're the same, and yet they're a little bit different. So virtual reality is when we are completely replacing our real world with, with a computer-generated world. And augmented reality is when our real world, you know, me standing here, is augmented with a layer of technology. Um, if you're familiar with that game that was hot a few years ago, Pokemon Go, um, I, I know my kids were all over it, but Pokemon Go is basically looking at the real world and then superimposing, you know, these computer images on top of the real world. And so when I talked about you know, the irony of mobile computing actually helping out, helping out stores, that's what I was talking about. I was talking about actually physical stores and taking advantage of being in a store and using augmented reality to, to sell you goods. Um, so we've got, I want to show you something, and this is, I think you're going to find this a little crazy. So here's a real quick video. This is technology that is available today. Oh yeah, I need to do the shopping. Welcome, man. What do you need? Hi, Super. I need some pasta. Let's see then. Ah, there it is. Whoops, I almost forgot. Lucy, who's gluten intolerant, is also going to be there tonight. Show me just the gluten-free products, please. Anne, I have activated the gluten filter for this shelf. Now I need snacks for my son. Hey Anne, you have almost reached the number of points necessary to claim the new prizes. I'll highlight the products that award more points. Yes, super, thank you. Look at these. So many points and great ratings. Nice, I'll take it. This is nice, what is it? Would you like to take a closer look? Yes, please. I like that. Should I book a test drive? Thanks. Test drive booked. I have sent you the address via email. Great. But now I need to get some shampoo. Hmm, this won't be an easy choice. These are the ones recommended by your friends. There it is. Hillary's favorite. Well done, Super. Got it. Good. That should be it. Let's go check out. Oh, I nearly forgot about the apple pie. Super, show me the ingredients. Anne, I have analyzed 10 apple pie recipes and the relevant ingredients. This is what is missing from your pantry. Okay, thanks. Anne, shall I proceed with payment? Hang on, Super. I might have picked up too many apples. Okay, now you can pay. Transaction authorized. What time will you be home in the afternoon? After 5 p.m. Perfect. Enjoy your supper. Thanks, Super. See you next time. Maybe I'll invite you. So, so that's cool and all, except that human delivering the groceries is almost assuredly going to be a robot. Um, there's been a lot of buzz about um, blockchain technology. Um, generally, people talk about blockchain in the context of cryptocurrency. So, blo but blockchain technology, it's pretty complicated, but what it is is it's a, it's a secure ledger system that allows transactions to take place. And the reason it's secure is because these transactions have to be validated across hundreds or thousands of different ledgers to make sure that these, these encryption codes match, and when they match, it validates the transaction. So blockchain has several different applications in the real to retail world. 
Um, first, I believe that at some point, cryptocurrencies will be a, a de facto standard of, of, of currency. And I think it's going through some growing pains now. But, you know, crypt, uh, cryptocurrency such as, um, such as a Bitcoin, uh, you know, the, it's, not, it's not tied to, you know, a central bank. It's not tied to a government. And, you know, we are used to, you know, a relatively stable currency here. But there's a lot of places in the world that, where it's very unstable. And so technologies like Bitcoin are very attractive. And there's a lot of people in the world outside of the United States. In other words, there's a lot more of people that are interested in that than are, than are not interested in that. So I think, I think it's a very real possibility that cryptocurrency will take hold at some point. But blockchain will also be useful in facilitating these transactions, these international transactions for, for um, e-commerce firms and even your local, your, your local retailer. So it is complicated. But it is behind the scenes a really integral piece of this of the future of retail. Robotics um, or automated uh, distribution and fulfillment, you know, it is it is um, it is as powerful and as impactful as robotics and automation was to the manufacturing industry. So it's. And as a matter of fact, the entire supply chain is effectively going to be automated. Even, you know, from the delivery of the good on a truck in an autonomous or platoon truck to a warehouse, it gets unloaded by robotics. It gets stocked via robotics. It gets put in another truck and out to another warehouse or a point of, or a retail through robotics. It, it you know, this robotics is just. Uh, it, it's permeating almost all job sectors. And so while it will eliminate some jobs, in, in some cases it'll be more of an assistive technology where you have a human being working in conjunction with a robot, like allowing someone to reach higher up on a shelf or carry something that is a lot heavier um, than, than you would normally be able to carry. Um, if you, you know, there's a lot of science fiction movies that, that have examples of this and it's rapidly becoming science fact. But autonomy is really the big one, um, you know, the uh, autonomous vehicles. This is, this is potentially the, the most impactful technology uh, to retail. And we've seen, uh, you know, the growth of autonomy and the adoption of autonomous vehicles. Uh, we believe it's quite similar to uh, smartphone adoption. And so it's, it's slow at first. Uh, as these devices are expensive, and then as the price of the devices decreases and as acceptance increases, adoption just shoots through the roof. So, the, you know, the arrow I have up on there is where we are at with the smartphone adoption curve now, um, which means almost everybody has a smartphone. And if the autonomous vehicles mimics this rate of adoption, uh, we're probably looking at about 20 to 25 years before it's, it's almost entirely autonomous vehicles. And there's four, four types of autonomous vehicles. Uh, you know, there's, there's the ownership model. Well, and then there's also traditional automobiles that we have up on this list. Uh, there's the, the shared model, which is mobility as a service. You'll see it abbreviated MAAS. And then there's, there's things like, uh, you know, public transportation autonomous vehicles. And so, you know, these, these are impactful in several different ways to, to not just retail, but all of our lives. Um, you know, we'll get, we're going to get into the retail bit a little bit uh, here um, later. But just for your everyday life, it's impactful because you now really, you know, don't need you wouldn't need you know, to be a three-car household or a two-car household. In theory, you could accomplish a lot of what you needed with one car that you owned and then uh, supplement your other needs with, with a service because these cars don't need to be parked anywhere. You know, if you take your car into work you know, and, and you're sitting at work for eight hours a day and somebody else in your family needs that car, you basically just send the car back to them and it doesn't sit in a parking lot. So that's when they talk about the impact on parking 
that autonomous vehicles will have. This, this, these are the sorts of things that we're talking about. So this is the last of, of the, the videos. So this is, this is actually being deployed right now. So this is a pilot program in, uh, I believe it's Scottsdale, Arizona, by the, the Kroger company. Kroger is the largest grocer in the United States. And this is what they're deploying today. It's with a company called Neuro. Right, so you get the point. They're, uh, you know, the robots are coming. <laughs> you know that that had a human actually going out into the car and getting the groceries. I can, you know, rest assured the future versions of that won't require that. Uh, Toyota has a has a joint venture with um, Amazon and Uber, and this they're calling this thing the e pallet And the e pallet is this strange-looking boxy vehicle that can be used to deliver. It can be used as a workspace. It can be used as, as a retail space. And so it's this, you know, this multifunctional autonomous vehicle. I'm bringing it up because you know, there's a lot of discussion among you know, the, the group that I work with at Urbanism Next uh, about whether or not we need to, to zone or regulate our street spaces like we do our land. If commerce is, you know, cities had a hard time dealing with food trucks. They've had a hard time dealing with uh, dockless bikes and, and e-scooters. But what happens when we've got these roving stores on the roads? Like literally you can get into a, you know, this could pull up right to your house and you could buy things out of it. There's things we need to think about. You know, how do we, how do we regulate these things? You know, how do you, how do you tax these things? How do you, how do you derive revenue from these things? Now, I don't have that answer. That's up to you. You know, I'm just here to tell you about it. <laughs> so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of big companies that are investing in, in the autonomy space. And, you know, as you will see, you know, on this list, you know, most of them aren't, aren't auto companies. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of tech companies. There's traditional retail companies. Um, you know, we've learned some hard lessons in the last few years, um, particularly about social media. And, um, and I think we've learned that when we get stuff for free, that it's not really free, that we are actually the product. I think we have to, I believe, we have to take that same approach with technologies such as these. So when you're offered a, a free ride somewhere, well, what's the... You know, what's the catch? There's always going to be a catch. So what that catch is, is going to be different depending on, you know, how we are interacting with this technology and what we are using. But if it's free, rest assured, there is a catch. Because these companies to date have, invest, have invested about $100, $100 billion. And at some point, they're going to demand a return on that investment. And then finally, let's talk about overbuilt retail. So by many um, experts' estimates, uh, retail is overbuilt by about as much as 50%. Um, 
since 1995, the number of shopping centers in the U.S. has grown by 23%, while uh, gross leasable area has increased by 30%, yet our population has grown less than 14%. Uh, currently, there's 25 square feet of gross leasable space per capita for every one of us in the U.S. Um, by contrast, in, in most European countries, that number is 2.5 square feet. Uh, things like state retirement systems uh, have traditionally invested in these real estate investment trusts, but that, that hold a lot, a lot of these commercial real estate holdings, and um, that's changing. You know, I've got a friend that works for the retirement, he's, a, he's an investor for the state of Ohio, and, and they are steering clear of this stuff until, until things sort themselves out, because they're not exactly sure what the, you know, what the future is going to look like. So this is a, this is a chart showing that, that retail square footage and, and sales per capita, and you can see you know, our next closest one is, is Canada. Um, but really, it's, you know, it's China and, and Europe that seem to be a lot more efficient. Um, it, you know, that said, we've got a lot of space. Well, we, spend, we tend to spend an awful lot, too, and, and, you know, and significantly more than, than these other countries. This is, the, this is a chart that shows the type of spaces that we're purchasing goods. And so I circled two of these types. I circled neighborhood retail and community retail, primarily because these are the types of centers that exist in our suburbs. See, I knew I would, you knew I would tie it back to suburbs at some point. Uh, neighborhood retail typically sits on three to five acres. There's five to 20 stores. Trade area is generally about three miles. And you've got 30,000 to 125,000 of, of gross leasable area. And there's usually a supermarket anchor. The community retail is 10 to 40 acres. Uh, the trade area is up to six miles. It's anywhere from 125 to 400,000 square feet of gross leasable area. And it has two anchors. So it's this, the fact that we've got so much, um, so much space in the U.S. and most of that space is concentrated into these types of centers and the retail industry is undergoing these, you know, these changes where it's, it's adopting this omni-channel omni presence, it's going to result in not just less, um, less retailers, but less required space. You know, that is really the big takeaway. You know, a lot of places are going to go up, out of business, but the ones that stay in business are not going to need nearly the amount of space that they currently have. This is the um, space that has been vacated since 2001, and typically the big jumps in vacated space correlate with, with national recessions, except for the most recent years, and, and this, is, this is concerning. You know, so this is something we need to keep an eye on, and I know, I know where, where we live, uh, vacancies have, have about doubled. In the, in the last five years in, in retail spaces. And that's why we see a lot of non-conventional retail uses going into these spaces. Things like, you know, things like churches and pop-up stores. You know, the, the Halloween store now appears in June. You know, the Halloween store used to appear in September. So um, neighborhood and community retail is the most vulnerable this is what's sitting in the suburbs. In the U.S., we have about 10,000 of these. Um, they make up about 4 billion square feet of gross leasable area. And in these centers themselves, just these types of centers, we have 12 square feet of retail allocated to every man, woman, and child in the U.S. And these are just store closings in 2018. Uh, you know, we got Toys R Us, Walmart, uh, Walgreens, um, Ann Taylor, Best Buy, a lot of things that you would expect. Recently, we, uh, you know, the data indicates that the pace of store closings has, has slowed. Um, so for the first time in a long time, um, we're not closing more stores than we did the previous year. I would caution that this is likely only temporary as stores try to uh, expand that omni-channel omni, uh, presence. Um, but I would be interested to see 
you know, what the pace is here at, you know, as we get to the end of the year and into next year, and what this looks like the next time we hit a recession. You know, if there's another recession on the horizon, which history tells us there likely is, you know, how is that going to quicken the pace of store closings and, and thus vacated space? So this is really a perfect storm. You know, the perfect storm of overbuilt retail, um, growth strategy and technology, and the, the consumer is squarely in the middle. And you can look at it a, a number of ways, but you know, the, the war over price has been fought for a long time. You know, that was, that was really what Walmart was famous for, and then Amazon came in. And we're fighting over price, and you can only squeeze so much profit out of something before it doesn't make sense to manufacture it anymore. The next battle will squarely be over our time. So what does that mean? Well, I'm pretty confident in saying it means we're looking at the, about, we're looking at the one hour delivery of everything. The one hour delivery of anything you can think of that you could put in your car or have delivered to you, even lumber. It's inevitable. Uh, you know, if you apply a, a version of Moore's Law to e-commerce and distribution, um, this is something that we could likely see in as little as three years. So anything that you can think of, you'll be able to summon and get delivered to you in less than an hour. Um, and I'm going to show you how I think this might take place. So this is a case study only, that, that, you know, don't run out and buy a bunch of, bunch of stock. But these are CVS pharmacies, and right now there's 11,000 CVS pharmacies in the U.S. that are within 15 minutes, um, or 82% of the U.S. population. I think something like a CVS pharmacy, something with that sort of reach, is more than likely an example of what the last mile looks like. So here's, here's an example. We'll start, with, um, we'll start with a warehouse. You know, this is Greater Salt Lake. And then we'll add in the, uh, the, the Whole Foods. So there, there's five Whole Foods that I identified in the area. And then we can add in the, the coals. And there's about seven coals showing up on this map. And then you add in the CVS pharmacies, and there's about 15 of those. And what starts to emerge is this hub and spoke distribution model, you know, where you're moving goods from the, from the, from the warehouse and getting them into these other smaller centers, getting them closer to us, closer to the consumer. That's how the war on time is gonna be fought. You know, how do you get things to people quicker? Well, you don't drive 100 miles an hour. You start with those goods being closer to you to begin with. So now we've got the, that origin mode. That is, that is one of the points on the last mile and then we can combine it with us, our homes, and our homes become the destination mode. And this is textbook uh, hub and spoke distribution. And you know, it, it will be, it also will be omni-channel, but you'll utilize things like, well they will utilize things like uh, artificial intelligence, you know, to anticipate where these goods need to be in place before you ever order them. And that'll go a long way towards ensuring that when you order something, it can be delivered to you. And if it's coming from something like a CVS, which is within you know, um, 15 minutes of 82% of the population, then rest assured, you know, they'll be able to get it to you in less than an hour. So this is what could happen. You know, th this, po this potentially is our future. You know, we're, we're staring at a lot of gridlock um, from all these deliveries hitting our, hitting, hitting our roads at once. And so it'll result in something like this in addition to something like this. Empty malls with tons, with tons of empty parking lot space. So there's some, there's some ways I think we can, we can address this and w ways you can address this. You know, it's really important to get serious about road network management. And technology can play, play a big role in that. Um, when we talk about uh, you know uh, things like um, congestion pricing and 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 user access uh, charges, we need to get serious about curb management. You know the the, the delivery of these goods at, at the curb, land values. Um, how how will these things affect land values? Uh, uh, legacy institutions like banks, 
people that loan money, people that need to be educated about where things are going, you know, these, these institutions tend to be risk averse. Zoning, that's a big one. There's a, gonna be a lot of redevelopment opportunities. We're gonna have a ton of excess parking. Sales property and income taxes. I, you know, we were having a discussion about uh, sales taxes earlier. And it's an opportunity to talk about transportation funding. So, you know, we don't, there's a lot of things we don't have data for. You know, we don't have data for, um, you know, our deliveries. And, and we're just now starting to get a handle on how we want to treat, treat these right of ways. You know, we can't build ourselves out of these problems. So we, you know, we need to reconsider some of the, some of the regulations and our approaches to these right of way zones and what we allow to take place within some of these right of way zones. It's simply hard to regulate what we don't understand. And right now, we, there is a, there's an incredible lack of data. And so it's really important that we start to accumulate more, more data um, because in the absence of, of, of data, we're just gonna make ill-informed decisions. So, you know, I mentioned congestion pricing. I think this is an opportunity to help us regulate, regulate the road. And we can use user charges, like charge more for deliveries than for, for commuter traffic, for example. Um, it might also be an opportunity to leverage like a national e-commerce sales tax to help pay for this transportation infrastructure. And we, we need to get serious about more comprehensive approaches to transportation, and that's building out these other networks for these alternative forms of transportation. Uh, since we can't build our way out of these problems, I, would, I personally am advocating for an expansion of public transit. And as, um, as I know a few of you in the audience are aware, I'm a huge advocate of uh, a fareless public transportation system to help facilitate that. Um, you know, this, you know, let me go back real quick. This is, so this is a real world example. This is, a, this is in Zanesville, Ohio. They had a, a, a company come in and, and occupy a vacant retail space. They, the city was under the impression they, they were a, a traditional retailer. And it turns out that that retailer was actually doing local distributions out of it. So the sales were taking place online and the distributions were taking place out of that retailer. It is a real life, real live, happening right now example of what I talked about when we talked about the, the CVS example and the hub and spoke model. So the city basically granted them a conditional use permit while they, while they try to figure out what's going on. You know, because under, under the way things were, were, were written in their zoning code, they were actually allowed to do that. So, you know, we'll, we'll skip through this pretty quickly, but uh, educating legacy institutions, these, these lending institutions and, and, and tradi traditional and non-traditional commercial, commercial investors, it's really important because that's where all the money is. And since they're so risk averse, they are, they are hesitant to invest in things that they don't have a, a firm understanding. And so a lot of my time is spent explaining to these folks you know, why things are important and how, and how it impacts them. So real quick, we'll talk about, um, you know, we'll talk about parking. The average size of a parking space is about 200 square feet. Um, you can get about 100 spaces in an acre of land. Um, you would need about three, three to four spaces for each, for each thousand square feet of retail. So that means if you're given one acre of land, um, you can develop about 10,000 square feet of retail. So these, these are the rules um, today, under today's conventional conventional development rules. But, you know, after everything we've talked about, we know this is, this is kind of nonsense. And, and as a matter of fact, you don't have to go far. You go out into any retail center, and, you know, there's just a handful of cars parked out there. And I know, you know, the conventional wisdom is you got to build for the busiest day of the year, which is the day after Thanksgiving. But, heck, I, I go by places, and even the, the parking lots don't, seem, don't even seem to be full on those days. If we remove personal vehicles, or if we radically change the need to park personal vehicles, and 
We combine that with the inevitability of this one hour delivery. That will even more significantly decrease the, the need for this parking. So these old development rules no longer apply. And so it's not just educating you know, bankers, lenders, these legacy institutions, it's educating ourselves, you know, transportation planners. Now I've, you know, to their credit, they, you know, they've been, you know, they've been all over this. You know, they, they, are, they are rethinking their traditional uh, transportation planning models and, and parking models. But bottom line is today, under these rules, parking is the number one constraint, de development constraint in almost any context. And so this is, um, this is where I live. This is Columbus and that red box over on the left, if you can see it, this is a real world example. I'm just gonna kind of illustrate what our options are and how significant it is. So this is, you know, this is in Columbus, but you know, this really could be just about anywhere in the US. So it's a, you know, it's a strip and big box center. About 21% of that site is just for green space and circulation. And then another roughly 23 for streets and access. And then about 16% is the actual building itself. So about 40% of that site is just dedicated to parking. Not to mention all those other things that are associated with parking. You know, so what's the bottom line? You know, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of opportunity for redevelopment. And so one of the things I advocate for is using this to, uh, using this, this is space to develop housing. Um, we could remove a lot, lot more cars from the road and reduce the amount of deliveries if we have housing that is close to some of these centers. You don't even need, you know, we don't even need to talk about knocking down half that center. You know, if we, if we really only need a fraction of that parking, then you could simply develop on the parking. Um, that said, keep in mind, these, these, these spaces, these, these retail outlets, these, these businesses, they don't even, they're not going to even need most of the space that they, they, they currently have. So if they reduce a lot of that space and that space becomes, um, the, remain, the, the space that they remove becomes like a, a little mini warehouse, you're also going to need to regulate and be on top of the fact that there's going to be delivery vehicle, vehicles shooting out of there. So instead of people coming in and, and parking and shopping, you know, there's a good chance that most of this traffic will actually be these, these, these delivery vehicles that are actually out there delivering things. And you know, real quick, I did some analysis of the Atlanta market and we looked at all these vulnerabilities and so I'm a, I'm a big GIS nerd and so I created some algorithms to try to uh, take in all these inputs of, of vulnerability and determine how much of the how much of the metro Atlanta market is vulnerable, and we determined six six percent, which doesn't sound like much, but that that's six percent that can be completely redeveloped, that is completely unnecessary, and sometimes that's concentrated all in one single place. So that that number, when you multiply that by the actual the perceived value of what that real estate is, that's a significant loss of of revenue, significant loss of, of, a, of a tax base. You know, so what does all this mean? Frankly, I think the places that are gonna survive are the places that are worth going to today. Places like traditional downtowns and Main Street, um, our downtowns of our cities. You know, we see a lot of these in our smaller towns and, and, and they are generally the core of our suburbs as well. But I think that, ex that experience, you know, it is somewhat of a buzzword, experiential retail. But there's a lot of truth to it. You know, if, if we're able to get all these things brought to us, then, you know, eventually we are going to want, you know, some sort of real world human interaction retail experience. And, and history also tells us that if you give me convenience, I generally just don't sit on my behind and enjoy the convenience. If I have four things I, I have delivered to me, and, and, and in theory I'm eliminating four trips, but there's four delivery vehicles bringing those things to me. I really haven't done anything to help out, you know, the community, our road network. And then add to that, if I've taken two hours, if I've saved two hours by doing that, maybe I want to go somewhere. So I've actually made the problem worse. You know, now I'm on the road in addition to these delivery vehicles. 
you know. But the places that will survive are those places that are worth going to. So maybe I find myself going to these places. So that, you know, there is a ray of light here. And, a, and the, the smaller neighborhood convenience type, type retail is likely going to be the ones that, are, that maintain their value. And so we're looking at places that are roughly right around 30,000 square feet of gross leasable area. Uh, they're smaller, they're more nimble. Um, you can do more with them. There's not nearly as much parking. So I think, I think uh, you know, the future looks relatively decent in, in the short to midterm for those types of spaces. But these spaces are in trouble. Um, they're in trouble today. They're going to be in a lot of trouble in, in five years, especially if all this kind of plays out as we, as we think it's going to play out. You know, so what does it mean? Well, ironically, it means long live the bookstore. You know, the thing that Amazon was credited with killing off is actually the thing that's worth keeping, the thing that's worth saving, that thing that is in these traditional downtowns and in these, in these you know, these strong neighborhood centers. So I know I've probably exceeded my time, and, you know, I don't know, Meg, if there's time for Q&A. However, I am going to be sitting on a panel at 1045, and a lot of these topics are going to be things that we're talking about. And um, if you have questions for me then, you, you can come and, and attend that, uh, that session. Um, I'll also be here all day and part of tomorrow. And if you see me walking around and you want to corner me and ask me a question, I'd be more than, more than willing. Um, so I hope you enjoyed today's presentation. And I hope I didn't scare you. Um, there are opportunities here. It's just we have to be out in front of it. And so, you know, if I have to, you know, this is your, this is your call to arms. You know, this is happening now. So we need to plan for this now, you know, to make sure our future looks decent. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Did we, I, I wanted to say thank you again to Rick Stein. Um, I want to give you an honorary title, a professional nerd. Oh. I think you were the epitome of that and I really appreciated your, um, all of the information that you had. We have a lot of issues that, that talk about housing and zoning and all of these other things and that integration was really helpful. So thank you, thank you so much. Does anyone have any questions? We have one down here. Do we have a? Microphone. Ooh. You know what? Maybe just shout it out really quick. We just have. So that. It depends. So the question was, where where do all these aut autonomous vehicles go? And so we have time for. Do we have time to answer this? Uh, briefly. Briefly. Um, they will go to the places that are probably, you know, this is an, this is an equity issue. We, we fear that they will, will end up going to the places and parking in the places that have the lowest land values. And so that is, a, you know, that's a really good question and that's an active conversation, you know, and it, and, it, and it speaks directly to equity. You know, are we going to move all these vehicles into the areas with the that are less desirable or have lower values. Um, we fear that that's where we're headed unless we get out on top of this. But uh, you know, just like data, they may never stop moving unless they're, unless they're actually just charging. So thank you, I apologize. I had the timing a little bit wrong and we do actually have time for a couple more questions, Mr. Stein, sorry about that. I just wanted him to see if he was gonna come back. <laughs> So, um, with that being said, um, I just want to entertain a couple more questions and um, any questions you have on elaborating anything. So, go ahead. There's one right there. In the so, so, the question was, um, you know, we've talked a lot about metropolitan areas, suburban areas. You know, how does this impact small town, smaller towns? Um, the great thing, now I grew up in a small town, the great thing about small towns 
is that they are generally adequately served. They're not overserved. The reason the suburbs developed all this, you know, ridicu ridiculously scaled retail is because land was cheap and it gave them access to not just people in the suburbs, but it gave them access to the people in the cities that the suburbs were, were, were surrounding. Small town retail is developed a little bit differently. You know, it's generally right-sized. Now, one phenomenon I've noticed across the United States is places or, or, or retailers like Dollar General going into small towns. They have, a, they have basically the same approach as a Walmart, but with a smaller footprint. So small towns, the future is actually extremely bright because those, those are the places that have really strong traditional downtowns. You know, those are the places worth going. Now, will things be delivered? It's entirely possible that the same delivery phenomenon will hit small towns. It'll just hit them later. There's also a school of thought that maybe small towns are the ones that are going to have to fend off drone deliveries. So drone deliveries, you know, we didn't even talk about drones at all. Um, largely because I think there's an awful lot of regu regulatory discussions that's, that need to take place about drones. So drones in cities, you know, that, that may be regulated to the point where it, it's, it's a non-starter. But if goods are primarily originating from cities or suburbs and then being flown into more rural locations to try to level the playing field and, and, and achieve that one hour delivery, that's a real possibility, and it's interesting. I brought that up to the same, so that was the zoning administrator in that small town example I gave. You know, they, and, I, and we were talking about drones, and he's like, and he said, Rick, where I live, if they see a drone, they're going to shoot it out of the sky. So, <laughs> so I, don't, you know, I, don't, I don't know. You know, I don't know how that'll play out. But, but I think, I think it, I don't believe you're going to be left behind. You certainly are better positioned. I believe, with respect to you know the long-term viability of retail, you you may not achieve that one-hour delivery goal, you know goal as quickly as these other places, but there's a very good chance that shortly thereafter, by utilizing things like drones, and we didn't even talk about 3D printers and and creating these things in your own home, so they never even have to be delivered; they're just created inside your house. And that's, that's a whole, whole, whole other discussion. I, I, we have one time, time for one more quick question. And I did hear somebody who had a question. Oh, yes, go right ahead. So, so we can look them up and see what they're doing? Okay, here's the short answer. Uh, no. <laughs> and, and that's the scary part. You know, the, that group I'm with, the Urbanism Next, you know, we've, we've got people from all over the country and a few from overseas. And, you know, we've, we've basically come to the conclusion that there's really nobody that is on the, on the leading edge. The deliveries thing, you know, I, as far as I can tell, I might be the, the evangelist or, or the one sounding the alarm bells on this. I, I, I haven't heard a whole lot of other discussion about how, how impactful this will be. I, you know, as best I can tell, it's, you know, it's just me right now, but you know, I think it's get, gaining traction. You know, ironically, I'm from, you know, I live in Columbus. So Columbus won the uh, US Department of Transportation Smart Cities grant which means a lot of things to a lot of different people, and the, pe and the people that live in Columbus aren't sure what the heck it means, you know, if you don't know somebody that is explicitly working on that project. But the Smart Cities program, you know, that is talking about things like autonomous vehicles and, and creating a platform for data, data collection, data management, and data sharing. Of all places that should be tackling this, because the money, I mean, there's a ton of money available, not just from the USDOT, but from all these other investors that are piggybacking on, of all the places that should be tackling this. I would think of it as Columbus, and they're not. And, but, you know, luckily I know a lot of the folks that are working there on this project, 
And, and, I, and they've heard me. I mean, believe me, they've heard me. They're tired of hearing me. So they are aware of it. And I am hopeful that their attention will turn to this subject matter before, um, before the conclusion of the project in two years. But you know, that is sort of the scary part. It's like most places have been in sort of a wait and see mode. Well, the last time that I think we were in like a wait and see mode was when you know, World War II ended and, and the suburbs you know, were created you know, when GIs came home, they had money to spend and automobiles were cheap. Um, and we, we built homes, you know, in somewhat of a haphazard fashion. And that development pattern has kind of maintained itself over the years. And it's, it's not a very efficient development pattern. And it's gotten less and less dense. You know, I, I try to avoid using the word density because it means different things to different people. But really, it's a, just a matter of efficiency. I fear that if we are not proactive, and you know, again, this is the call to arms to be proactive, then we can expect the same sorts of consequences that we were left with you know, post-World War II and, and these development patterns. So you know, cross your fingers, but you know, it's you know, no pressure, but it is all on you. you know, I, mean, I mean, ultimately, it's all on you. you know, I can bring it to your attention, and I can help. You know, I can help craft policy, you know, and anticipate some of these things. But ultimately, you know, you're called the uh, Utah League of S Cities and Towns. You know, that's got, you know, that, that reminded me of like the Justice League cartoons, you know, the, the superheroes. So you are, you know, you're all superheroes, you know. So your job is to save cities and towns from themselves. But it is important that we ask these questions about technology. And we don't just be subservient to technology and just let it roll right over us. I think we've learned some lessons in the last few years. And um, you know, here, here's an opportunity to get out in front of it. So good luck to you on all that. <laughs>